Sorry, guys. I totally forgot to eat. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. Got a wet bar. Hey, good morning. It's a Monday. Monday the something. August what? Fourteenth, fifteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth. Uh, fourteenth. Hey, uh, hey, look at that. Monday, August fourteenth. The week before the big week, maybe. Oh, that's hot. Let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. Please stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. My name is Wayne. I'm a currency trader like you. I just happened to start earlier. And uh, this is my opportunity to give back to uh, uh, an industry that has given so much to me. I want you to be uh, as extremely successful as humanly possible. That's going to take blood, sweat, and tears for years. Please feel uh, free to ask questions. I can share uh, past experiences, good and bad, in regards to scalping, spot, swing, position, portfolios, fundamental analysis, technical analysis, trader psychology, and everything else under the sun. We do these sessions 7.30 in the morning, Monday through Friday here at Forex.today. Thank you, Forex.today. First Friday of the month is not for payrolls, and I do that over at uh, FX Street, and I've been doing webinars over there for 12 years, something like that, 13 years maybe, probably 13 years. So uh, I've been doing this a while, man, doing this a while. So uh, please get involved, ask questions. It's called participation. Cool. So I think you see my charts. It's a good starting place. Whoa, real, what's the security alert? Uh, real uh, information is not available. Do you want to proceed? Uh, yeah. Never seen that security uh, warning before. All right, cool, whatever. All right, so. Another interesting week, another fairly quiet week to be on the schedule, right? Should be too much. We have uh, UK inflation, I think it is. What is that, tomorrow? Life is great, life is grand, life is good. I'm going to open up the calendar. Hang on. Too many windows open. Just logging in here. Sorry. Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, so anyways, uh, what I plan on doing here is going through the calendar, looking at the event uh, risks for the week. And then we can go through the charts. We can start looking at swing trades. Uh, we can see where we are uh, as far as setting up uh, portfolio trades. And taking forever to log in here. I don't know why. There we go. Too many things going on for this little laptop. Wait for it. There we go. So let's scooch it down here. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's go to news. Let's do calendar. Hope you don't mind. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. We're a lot. Cool. Let's change impact uh, high only. Our BA. It's going to give you some articles to read. Is anybody going to volunteer and read the RBA announcement or the meeting minutes? 
to maybe write a summary for uh, Forex Stock today. You can eat at the desk, Marina. So, is anyone going to volunteer to read the uh, Reserve Bank of Australia meeting minutes? And post a summary on Forex.today. Do it for yourself. Moving on, there we got the uh, inflation data out of, uh, out of the UK. Followed by retail sales out of the United States. Now, retail sales, good job, Chuck. I mean, this is, the, this is the process that you need to go through to become a successful trader. You need to review uh, central banking reports, central banking media minutes, central bank, uh, almost everything. There's all kinds of things that they do. Rate announcements. Yeah, you read it anyway, so put together a summary, right? So anyways, uh, moving on here. Um, Later that day, uh, later tomorrow, we have retail sales of the United States, and that's a big one. That's definitely a big one to trade because 70% of our economy is uh, C, consumption, consumer. I, I call it consumer. So that's, that's a big one. Wednesday, FOMC meeting minutes, another opportunity to read and write a report. Is anyone going to volunteer to read the FOMC meeting minutes and write a summary on Forex Stock Today? I want to be a professional, Wayne, but that's too much work. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. All right. Aussie Jobs on Wednesday evening, which is another great trade. I have very fond memories of the Aussie Jobs report. And then Thursday, ba -ba -ba -ba, ECB stuff, CPI stuff. That's going to be a doozy. Okay. CPI. ECB, great. So Euro at the end, lots of U.S. news this week, mostly retail sales. This is going to be good. So we got like Asia tonight, Asia Wednesday, yeah, and Wednesday, Monday night, Wednesday night. So it's kind of spread out. They're important news, but they're, uh, it's not too much. Let's throw in medium now. Chinese foreign direct investment, nah. Didn't we have that last week? It must be month over month versus year over year. Euro GDP, or uh, German GDP, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's a good medium. PPI, we don't care about PPI as much as we do about uh, CPI. Ruble. By the way, I know where you can buy like 5 billion euro, uh, rubles for cheap. So yeah, 9%. Funny thing is, wasn't it like 11% or 13%? So it's tumbling, only 9%. Kind of makes you want to have like ruble Swiss franc, huh? Import export stuff, you know, that gets stuck into a GDP. The housing stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah. Housing should be winding down, but that's going to be for last month, so. Building permit, the housing starts, okay, fine, fine, fine. All of this should be on trend, and right now the trend is slowing. It's still positive, but it's slowing, right? 
Now, Japan is showing signs of doing better. Now, the interesting thing, and we've talked about this in the past, in particular, maybe not Japan, but in particular China, where those exporting economies do better when the importing economies start to do better. Because how could an exporting economy improve if the importing economy is not improving? So if Japan is stabilizing its economy, it's because Europe is getting its act together. And if you remember when China was spending stimulus to stabilize its economy, I was suggesting that instead of stimulizing their own economy, they should stimulize the European economy. Wholesale, pound retail sales. You know, when it comes down to uh, Great British Pound and retail sales and stuff, uh, retail sales did spike on the initial drop of the, the value of the pound. But I think that slowed down significantly. And uh, I don't know, see, since things are, since retail sales are announced in currency terms, not in units sold, but currency sold. If the value of the currency falls, then you need more currency to buy what you used to. So retail sales go up, which always told me that um, it seems to be a flawed way of measuring, right? So maybe, and I, and I think what I'm getting to is the, the number of widgets and gadgets and services provided in the UK hasn't gone up or down but you'll see fluctuations in things like retail sales reporting. And the only thing that's fluctuated was the, the currency and the ex currency exchange rate. Which, you know, if you really want to get into something, uh, you can go back to school, like somebody I know, and if you study economics, one of the things you could look into if you're doing like a uh, PhD or something is to show how these old models are failing and suggest new models. So, for example, the British pound lost significant value due to Brexit, which it should. It's risk. Okay, fine. So, what the traditional models in the textbooks will tell you, because the British pound fell so much, foreigners would just flood into London and start buying everything. And it's not actually the, the case. Okay? It's not, it's not quite true. It's not quite playing out that way. And then maybe it's globalization. Maybe the world's a little bit different than when your professor, see, your per, the professor in your university has never actually been in the real world. They, they went to school. They learned other people's theories. They mastered writing and speaking about other people's theories of the world, and then they got hired to teach other people those other people's theories, right? So uh, I can't get my... Ugh, watch is too big. I can't even get my shirt on. Button. So anyways, uh, someone needs to go back and say, um, all right, the British pound lost significant amount of value. Why did the models not predict what actually happened? What, what should happen? Why didn't it happen that way? And what seems to be happening is exchange rates maybe go up and down, but business continues exactly the same one way or the other. Maybe because there's better hedging. Uh, so on and so forth. Maybe the market is is more um, efficient. Okay. Throwing down into the uh, medium level stuff. Oh, by the way, look at the capacity utilization, industrial production. That also goes into uh, GDP. You'll see that. And then on uh, Friday, Canadian uh, inflation. Another pretty good one. All right, so Friday is going to be uh, pretty decent. Thursday is going to be pretty decent. Wednesday is going to be pretty, you know, so good. Pretty decent trading week.
You guys want to do the commitment of traders report? We haven't done it in a while. Oh, Marina commenting on my uh, discussion of retail sales um, being in currency volume, not unit volume. Uh, one of the things that really throws it off, Marina, uh, is when um, gasoline prices are really high. There's, you know, when that occurs, or even gasoline prices are really low. Because humans tend to spend a lot of money on gasoline. They drive to work, right? And so as gasoline prices fluctuate up and down, people or economists say, see, look, retail sales are way up. See what that means? It means people feel really good. You know what I mean? So do you really feel good when gasoline prices are high and you're driving to work? I mean, what are you going to do when gasoline prices are high and you got a, a, a 30 or 40 minute commute each way? What are you going to do? Like ride your bicycle? You're like, I'm going to ride my bicycle out of protest. No, you got to go to your job. You got to get paid. You got to have all this money so you can pay for health care, insurance, uh, child care, health care, and a little bit of money left over for food. <clears throat> so you got to drive to your lousy job, right? Whether prices go up or down. Yeah, maybe, right, Hans? But, um, so anyway, so those very often, I, and I used to get really upset about this. This was back, you know, even 15 years ago, I guess. I'd get upset about these things thoroughly because you'd hear it on TV. Oh, retail sales way up. It means the consumer feels really good. I'm like, the consumer doesn't feel good. Are you retarded? Nobody likes their dead end job. Nobody likes the fact that they have to commute an hour and a half every day. Nobody likes the fact, you know, they're... The, they have to spend 60% of their income on their house. Nobody likes the fact that they're, they're a babysitter with tattoos on their neck, make $5,000 a month to sit and watch TV while your kids eat potato chips. You know, like nobody likes these things, but that, those are the costs. So anyways, let's move on, .com. This isn't, I guess, maybe because I'm zoomed in. All right. We got this uh, July, August. Yeah, I guess so. All right. All right. Anybody new to the Commitment of Traders report? Yeah, it doesn't show up. Carol? Okay. This is a measure of open positions in, in the futures market. So let me ask you something. Is it important to know if the amount of euro that uh, people have already bought is high and going up? Sure, Bev. Yeah. It's, they're actually just futures contracts. That's all it is. So what if lots and lots and lots of people were buying Euro futures contracts? It's important, isn't it? Because it, it, it's not opinion. It's literally the number of contracts open right now. People have already bought them. So the trend in the buying is important, but the change in trend in buying is also important. So like uh, little dips like this. Why, why did people, or that's actually price, but, um, but anyways, imagine uh, people have been buying a, a particular currency uh, quite a bit, and all of a sudden they stop buying it. 
Just the fact they stop buying is important, isn't it? And then lastly, the, the thing that I think most people miss when using the COT data is that you can have a currency that is rising, but nobody's buying it. And that is also very useful information. And I've seen the euro go up 700 pips, and yet nobody's buying it. How is that possible? Yeah, cashing out of what? Essentially a short, right. It's not that it's going up, it's that they were short that earlier. Or to say, if to use the euro as an example, in the current, in the currency market, not the futures market, in the forex market, people were buying dollars. Okay, had nothing to do with anything else. They just wanted to buy dollars. Great. Well, in the foreign exchange market, that means if you're if you're buying dollars, you need to be selling something else because you're exchanging the something else for dollars. Now, euro, for example, was a favorite. Sell the euro to buy the dollar. So euro dollar down, right? So you. There were times when you saw euro dollar going up and up and up and up and up and up, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pips. But then you go to the futures contracts market, which this is now a measure of, and nobody was actually buying euros. Okay, so it's not perfect because we're talking about a cash market, and then we're looking at COT data, which is futures contracts, not a cash. But people were not like, flowing into euros. They were simply, but the euro was going up. And what you were seeing was people are getting out of the euro dollar short. So they're cashing out of that, which then means they have to sell their dollars and buy back their euros. Right? So what that told me, and we've talked about this a lot in the past, what that told me is when the market can, they will want to sell it again because they just made a whole bunch of money. So it might be weeks, it might even be months. Like the summer, Euro dollar was way down, people cashed out of those positions, maybe they come back in September and October and they sell Euro dollar again. They sell at 118 and they want to take it back down to 108. That, that wouldn't be crazy, would it? I think that's within reason that it could fall from 118 to 108. I'm not saying it will. What I'm just saying is that's a 1,000 pips, and 108 isn't crazy low. It could fall another 1,000 pips. So that's why we need to look at the, the COT data. What does that show us? What can we learn? Okay, so let's, let's take a look and see what we can learn. Now, the first thing you want to look at is, let me get my drawing tool here. The first thing you want to look at is this light gray line. The, right, the light gray line is the, num uh, is the number of futures contracts traders have already bought. See, it's not opinion. It's not sentiment. How do you feel about the euro? Oh, I feel really uh, very strongly about the euro. Who cares about people's opinions? How much money did they put into the market? That's important, right? How much did they actually buy already? And what was the difference between last week and the week before? That's also important, right? So we'll look at the, the line here, and I'll draw over it with my red. Each of these little dots is a week. Those are the open positions of futures traders buying euros. Isn't that interesting? Okay, let's now change and add to this. 
down here in light blue is the number of short positions. So let's take a look at this. Those are now traders that are short. Short the euro. Okay. Let's talk about the red line first. Those are buyers. Has there been a significant amount of new buyers in the euro market over the last six months? Uh, six months is this is January right here. So I'll mark January. Black. Uh, right here. This is the year. Okay. I would say there's a little bit. So we open the year about here. And now we're here. So there's this distance of new buyers of Euro. It's reasonable, but it, I wouldn't call that significant, would you? I mean, it's very subjective how you describe it. Okay. But look at this. This is number of short contracts, right? We started the year here. And now we're down here. Oops which is more, it's a little above this, and it's below that. So here's what I'm trying to get to. We've had this many people buying Euro, and this many people no longer selling Euro. Therefore, two-thirds Two-thirds of this euro rally is people just simply not no longer selling euro. So is it bullish in your opinion? Or is it long-term sellers are getting out and short-term buyers are getting in? Now, the actual price of the euro versus dollar is this line. Okay. So, see, now we can really look at things like a euro dollar rally and see, and say, is it mostly buyers or is it mostly sellers exiting? How many people would agree that, that that is important information in the long run? Yeah, it could be fool's gold, right? Now, is there anywhere else you can get this information besides looking at this data? Factual data, not sentiment, not opinion, factual data. Is there any other place you can get this to really understand a rally? Uh, options? Uh, I, I would just say no, Chris. Yeah. Like, that makes me think, like, maybe it does in equities, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be every equity. You'd have to have enough volume in the put-call ratios and stuff, right? 
Yeah, this is what I'm specifically looking at, John, is essentially hedge funds. Okay. I used to have a subtitle on this. I guess it's no longer here. Um, it is uh, essentially hedge funds. Yeah. So, so just as an example for everybody, this data is required by law to be reported. This is only U.S. investors, and this is only the futures market. Okay? Matters. Okay? And the United States realized, and this was probably uh, in the Great Depression or something, um, but at some point in the world, the U.S. government realized they needed to know what was going on in the financial system because it was important to the economy. And so they, they asked large institutional investors to share their large open positions. Well, people don't want to do that, right? Hey, Goldman Sachs, tell us all your open positions. And Goldman Sachs says, go to hell. We're not going to tell you that, right? So the government sits down there like, hmm. Why don't we provide a tax break to market participants that are in the futures market only to hedge because they can look at the futures market and they can see the number of contracts open okay there are 152,321 futures contracts long wheat okay done some people are buying that because they use wheat like General Mills that makes cereal they use wheat to make a product, and then they need to sell the product. They're not in the futures market to speculate. They're in the futures market to lock in a price, to hedge a futures price, a future price. They want today's price in the future. So they go to the market only to lock in the, the price, to hedge their position. Great. So the government says, all right, General Mills and everybody else, if you're buying these contracts simply to hedge, let us know, and if you're a bona fide hedger, you'll, you'll pay lower taxes or like no taxes or whatever on the scenarios of you making money, right? Because they're not doing it to make money. They're buying the futures contract because they're losing money in a different market, and it just hedges, right? So now all those companies flood in to report, we're a bona fide hedger. We're in this market to hedge. Great. So now we have a certain amount of the open positions. We know the exact number, but now we know the exact number that are in, right, simply to head. Okay? Now we have the other open contracts that are not hedgers. So they're speculators, large institutional investors. Now we know they're large because you have to report your institutional size investments. So we have that number, but there's also a total volume. What about all the ones that are not large enough to report, but when you look at the number of traders, sorry, the number of trades being issued, the number of futures contracts being traded, you'll have a total number, and then you'll have the total reported number, and then you'll have the total reported number for hedgers. So you can take hedgers out, Right? Everyone else are speculators, and the ones that have reported are large institutional speculators, so like a hedge fund. And then the rest of all of that that's not reported because they're not large institutional investors, but you do see the trading volume, then those are small speculators like you and me. So now you got total volume. Those that didn't report are speculators small speculators those that did report but are not hedgers are speculators but they're now they're large institutional speculators and then there's bona fide hedgers so now you get everybody 
in the entire market simply because it's reported. It's cool, right? Did I just lose my computer behind me? <laughs> yeah, oh, wait, it's back. Dude, don't touch that button. Holy smokes. It's like everything just went bonkers, huh? Dang. Um, yeah, that was kind of creepy. I'm like, North Korea just attacked. <laughs> you know what? I should just grow old, sit in front of my TV all day and watch political news in my underwear, drunk. And I'm going to call in to the radio shows too. My name is Wayne, I'm from Georgia, and I just think it's disgraceful what I see these days. Welcome to America. Anyways, I don't know where that came from. Did I just say that out loud? Yeah, forget it. All right, so let's take a look at Pig. Otherwise known as the Great British Pound. Beep. So let's do red long. Is that what we're doing? Red long. All right. Oops. Red long is the light gray. So <laughs> That's like going back to 2016. That's a full year, right? Okay. Would you call that a significant change in traders that are buying British Pound? You're like, whoa! Look at all the buying! Okay. See, this is interesting, right? Isn't the British pound up significantly over the last several months? So let's try, and this time I'll draw it because that was not that easy. Let's do in blue. So now we got to do light blue or the short positions. And this is light blue. Okay, now why is the blue line higher than the red line? Let's just make sure we understand what's going on here. Why is it higher? Just so it's easier, so they don't overlap so much? What does this chart actually mean? Well, the number to the left is the number of contracts. So, in August of 2016, there was, uh, let's just call this 35,000 contracts long the Great British Pound that are not hedging. Okay? Buyers a pound and they're trying to make money when they buy it. They're buying it to make money. 35,000 contracts. The same day, there was 135,000 contracts short. What? 35K versus 135K. <laughs> Let's do the math. How many more futures contracts were short than long? Hey, 
Okay, were they, were they, so let's just recap. Was it 100,000 contracts of buyers or 100,000 contracts of sellers in the differential? So there was more sellers, AKA approximately 100,000 contracts short. Oh, we got that on the chart too. Isn't that fecty? That fecty. That's hot. That's hot. Right? That's fecty. Is that sweet? We already got that data, bro. Right here. This is the net. Is that sweet? So check this out. This was rising. The red arrows were not really rising, but the net was rising, which means the number of sellers was falling by about, would you say 75,000? 75% less shorters relative to buyers? I'd call that significant. And what did the British pound do? I got to go yellow and you're not going to be able to see it. But that's what this is. This is the price. Okay. The pound versus the dollar went up. Nobody was really buying. But there was 75% less bears. And that started around April. And all this information was available to you on Forex.today for your analysis, for your understanding, for free. Hey, the boo boo. See, now, if you start to do analysis like this, you might sound like a professional when you speak to other people in your industry. And you say, well, did you know, when you look at this commitment of traders report, I see blah, 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 blah. And that explains this, ah, da, 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 da. And people are like, whoa, what? It's not buyers, it's 75% less sellers. So what do you think is going to happen when people come back from holidays? Do you think some of these sellers might return? I don't know. Maybe things are different now. We don't know, Peter. You tell me. See, but now you're thinking. That is the important part. What you decide is going to be based on all kinds of things. Okay? I don't know. But that's why it's important that you make your own decisions. You can be smarter than everybody else. Maybe you're not smarter than everybody else. Maybe you're raised in a good way. Maybe you're raised in a bad way. Maybe you have a good education. Maybe you have a bad education. But it all can come together. And you filter it like charcoal right, the information through your gray matter, and it pops out, and you might be righter than me. So what I think is not important, it's only important to my clients. <laughs> What's important is what you do. But the thing is, how could you make a, an important decision like this when you're not even looking at this data? Or how many people look at this data and don't actually get it? Okay. So as long as you know that this information is there, you can start to study it if you want. Okay.
We can do Aussie. Let's do Aussie. So according to this Aussie dollar, so we go look weekly closing price seventy four. Sorry, uh, seventy nine sixty. That's what this blue line is. Seventy nine sixty. So we'll mark that. So this is where we closed. Okay, cool. And you see that right here, seventy nine sixty. Back in May, we were here. What would you call that? Well, I guess we can actually get that. Let me turn the drawing tool on. That week, we were 74. So we went from 74 to 79. Now, it, it took us from the middle of May. So 500 pips is not a lot. So for May, June, July, now we're in the middle of August. So 500 pips for four months is not a lot, but it's up sharply anyways, right? So why? Well, I see this seems to be pretty sharp too. Okay. What is the light gray line? That's number of people buying okay so that's number of people buying and then that changed about uh first week of june so nfp and now we see that so buyers leaving buyers returning how interesting huh so what happened last year January, February, March, April, May. No, March, April, May. Okay. So let's go here now. Look what happened last September. So this is uh, end of August and then September. And then this is basically end of the year. So what if, uh, is it possible that uh, in the next couple of weeks we do this? So this is exactly a year ago. We were actually falling at this time of year, but probably not by much. But what if September and October and, and November, so this is Thanksgiving, by the way, in the United States of America. So what if September to the third week of November, we get a rally? Is that plausible? It happened last year. Now, you might... Now, you might say, well, Wayne, that's the, the Trump election. Well, go back year after year after year. Go back seven years and, and see what happened and uh, whatever, right? And then you could say, oh, well, that's all the Fed and stuff. And you're like, well, no, go back 20 years. Okay. The only other scenario, if you're not planning for it to go up, is that you say, well, during September, October, and November, maybe December, it goes down this year instead of up. Do you feel like the RBA is going to cut interest rates? What are the chances the RBA comes out and says, we're going to slash interest rates another 50 basis points? Well, how do you know? How do you know? I don't want an opinion.
Come on, guys. You're the expert. You're going to talk to your clients, help them make decisions. Say, well, I know for a fact because I read the RBA meeting minutes, which come out today. Right, Chuck? Yeah. Now you know. You say, well, I know what the RBA discussed at their most recent meeting. And when you look at historical data and recent commitment of traders report positioning, I expect the Aussie dollar over the next five months to do dot, 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 dot. How low can you go? Wait to profit that I think you want to listen to. What do you can say to you? What you want to do? Follow for now. Power to the people. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Chuck. That was Chuck D right there. That was Chuck D. All right, so blah, 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 blah. I spent enough time on that. If you like that kind of stuff, look, it's there 24 hours a day. Do it whenever you want. Maybe you can go back 100 years and find out what's happened last the two Septembers ago and three Septembers ago and four Septembers ago and five Septembers ago and see if there's a pattern. Okay. Look at this is 2011, September. Okay, September started right here. September did this, and then uh, uh, in, in so that September, October, November, and December. Wow, this one was late. When I usually want this to come around here pretty late so there it is a little dip in August September stabilization and end of the year rally 2011 I just grabbed that randomly I don't know I can't go back farther than 11 Okay. So where is this? August, kind of sideways. Down in September, up in October, up in November, and uh, and and down in December. All of which you th again. This is sort of. Up until Thanksgiving and then out. So whatever, do your own analysis, bro. Okay, Euro dollar. So we already have this line in the sand marked from before. Do you guys remember doing this? This lower low predicted a lower high. We drove that over there. That should have been a short. Went into our next level of support, which it popped back up. We already had the, that resistance marked off the left shoulder, which is another opportunity to sell. None of this is complicated. You have to decide if you're a bull or a bear, however, because now, which we already have this marked, we're kind of getting into this area. And a bull would want to start uh, to buy, and a bull is going to go down. Uh, you know, let's not do it this way. Let's get rid of that. 
And so a bull is going to go like this. And it's way too late for a bear, isn't it? So most likely it'll do like that if you're a bear. So it comes down, you know, trading's pretty easy if you do your analysis. If you're a bear, this is a sell zone. There's no doubt about it. And if you're a bull, this is a buy zone. There's no doubt about it. And where amateurs tend to lose money is they're doing all kinds of weird stuff here in the middle. They're buying early, they're selling late, and it's not working. Oh, today for me, I don't know what it is for you. Today, so tomorrow, Asia, which is to tonight for me, as far as the RBA. Namaste. So how do you prevent being early or late? Let me put my shoulder back so I deleted it by accident. doesn't have to be that way. It's just a plan, Tucker, just a plan. If you knew you were a bear, I don't know where else you'd be looking to sell. You don't like the pivot point? You don't like the London Open? You don't like the double top on a smaller time frame? Or even tr triple top if you want to trade it that way? Look at that. I mean, like, I just don't get it. If you were a bear and you were trading, maybe you were not trading. But if you were a bear, I just don't understand how you'd miss that. So if you're a bear sitting in there waiting, somewhere on here you would have sold. I mean, you just would have, right? So you should be short up, up in here, okay? That's all. Now, if you're a buyer, you need to wake up and uh, see what's going on in here, right? Because you're going to want you're going to one two three that way off the fib reset it off the two hundred uh, you know let's just change the time frame here okay. and a bull is going to want to take this north okay and you're going to trade it like that okay. okay. So that's what a bull would do. Pretty easy if you're a bull. Pretty easy if you're a bear. It's only complicated when you haven't decided if you're a bull or a bear and you're avoiding the decision that's most important. So let's take a crack at this. So there's only two choices here. You trade this, oops. Let's kill that. You trade this like a one, two, three. And this is your sell zone. Okay. You trade it like a, uh, a swing trade as a bear. A swing trade bear is going to sell in, in that area, which is pretty gosh darn close to where we are. Okay. Or you're a bull. Okay, bulls are going to buy in here. This sort of area here is bullish. Up here is bearish. But you also have the breakout, which is breakout retrace to the roll reversal, which I already have marked on Friday, and you sell.
right? Break low of that, right? We come back to the resistance, oops, and then down. All right? So you can see, once again, if you have a bias, it should be pretty easy. Okay? Here's the breakout, which again, I just dragged it across. I marked that on Friday. We drag it across after the lower low. It's simply a retracement, okay? Back to the roll reversal. It's also a 3A2. It's also a four hour 21. And just above it is a huge sell zone. So I think if you were a bear, that's pretty easy. Okay. There's only what? Four or five reasons to sell that if you're already a bear? Cool. And here's the interesting thing. If you're it, right, you would also be a bear here. You would also be a bear here, and you'd also be a bear here. So if you sold uh, at the London Open, sort of in this zone, your stop should be above here. Okay, so you're going to need about a, a dollar for this trade. Selling at 49. Uh, stop at 50. $2 would be better, right? So what you see now, this rally here is going on is the open of the U.S. oil market. Oil trading is starting now. So if you're a bear, you're really hoping that this rolls over and heads down. Because bulls, now, this is your buy zone. Okay. A bull wants to buy here. So you're trying to pick it up at uh, 48.50, and your target's going to be M4. So you're going for 50.50. Okay. So you're either selling it at 49 or buying it at 48.50, right? And that's that. Okay. You have to ask yourself, what, what do you think the, this technical analysis is telling us? Okay. We're we're in. If we're not in a trend, then we're definitely in a range, right? So if, if the bears are correct and it breaks low here, it's going to break way low. If the bears are wrong here, it's going to go up to here, probably not hit the M4, probably get caught on the R1, and we do this. That's what I'm stinking. How about you? What do you stink? Smell like a plan? See, I think the way to have done it is to have sold it up in here. Okay. So it's your call. So you can see even if even a bull, even a bear, or let's say bulls and range traders would be buyers near the price that we're at now. Only bears would reject this. But a bull and a range trader would buy it. A bull would want it to go higher than 50. A range trader is going to say it's going to get just shy of 50 and limp out. So it comes down to are you, are you um, a bull 
a bear or market neutral, which means you could just be scalping this, right? And you don't really care what the direction is. And that's going to affect things like kitty cat. Okay. We've got this marked up quite a bit. You notice how last week, I think it was Friday, we were talking about how it looked like this trend was slowing down, and that's why I drew this kind of like a pitchfork. I said this is aggressive uptrend. If it drops down here, it'll be a, a slowing, less aggressive uptrend. And maybe that's what's happening. So now you need to decide, are you going to trade it like this? Hang on. Are you going to trade it like this? Well, you need to to go up. So pay attention. Are we going to head back up to 50 and break above 50? If not, if you feel like it's going to head back down to like, let's say, 47, then this is much more likely to continue up. Okay, that's why we look at these multiple markets into market correlation. Pound is going to be a lot like the euro, gold. Amazing coincidence, huh? We hit the monthly R line and stopped. Look at that. Look at the preciseness here. Weekly M3, monthly R1. Now remember, like, the if you were watching TV, they were telling you we were at the at the brink of nuclear war with North Korea. <laughs> bunch, of, bunch of morons. Anyway, we're at the brink of nuclear war. Um, look at gold. It's still responding very, very, very logically. People knew these levels. Okay. <clears throat> and now they're trading it. R means down, WM3 means down. Which probably means dollar up, which probably means uh, what? Oil down, probably means USD CAD up. Maybe even USD Yen back up, because Yen if you looked at the BOJ data last week, um, it was pretty uh, impressive, which should weaken the yen. Here's that stupid peso trade. Trade it the way you want. It's your call, bro. But look at the peso reacting to our pivot points. Amazing coincidence, right? Look at that. Maybe one pit box. USD yen, we'll see. Dollar's still pretty weak. But look at we got all of this marked up. I have 108. Looks like 109 is held. Monthly support pivot, by the way. Do you think that's a coincidence, that that's the support pivot? That's monthly support. Pretty amazing coincidence, huh? Maybe you should really seriously study pivot points.
Maybe it should become an important part of your analysis. Just suggesting. And some pivots. Aussie yen. These are dailies. I'm going to move these to weeklies. And I'll put some clusters on them. So my positions are vulnerable right now because we're coming off the central pivot. So I have a couple hundred thousand, each with a stop at break even. So uh, praying never hurts. Oh, right on, Tucker. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a lot of info, huh? So anyways. Well, pray never hurts. Hopefully, I get New York open in my favor. That's Aussie yen. Take a look at CAD yen here. Let's put that on a four hour. CAD yen, I'm also long $100,000. Stop on that one's also a break even. Uh, also being rejected off the weekly central. A little bit more room to breathe. But once again, praying never hurts. Not in good positions. I have another entry down in here. I might try again with the double cluster of support, plus a potential for the double bottom. So you can see I have a support, uh, a, a buy limit as a plan B. So that's, what did we look at? Aussie and CAD. You can look at Kiwi, look at that four hour. You can see I'm long $100,000 on this one. And uh, this one is stuck on daily. Let's switch this out. Template, let's go pivot clusters. Let's go clean that up. And it didn't even hit the central. Uh, I have 100,000 on this also, once again, Stop at break even. Pray never hurts. Hope's not a strategy, but praying never hurts. So I have uh, 400,000 at break even. Just waiting it up. I, I know I'm a week, at least a week early on this. So you take a shot, take a walk. What can I say? But at least I'm not risking anything. Uh, yeah. So anyways, hey, I'll see you tomorrow. Peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. Thank you for being a client to Trader's Way. If you haven't gone with the, the red triangle yet, please visit tradersway.com and open an account. And let us uh, Give us the honor of uh, earning your loyalty and respect. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Yes, I will post the video. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we did the COT data. Three, two, one.